there is this force in the wave that is that is compelling. The composition is very powerful and seems free from unnecessary rules. I think this piece is so interesting because it has such an open-ended story. That man was an incredible, glorious genius. Hokusai could paint with anything. A brush, a bottle, an egg, and even a live chicken. Imagine crafting your own wall art. Maybe it's a passion that fascinates you. Or maybe it's the promise of an immersive creative experience like no other. A piece of iconic art you can build for yourself. Relax and reconnect with your creative side. We've created unique soundtracks curated around the world of art, music, and movies. And in this soundtrack, we dive deep into the iconic print, The Great Wave by Hokusai. We'll hear from Japanese art curator Naoko Mikami. What Hokusai actually does here is taking the tallest and the smallest thing you can find in Japan and then reversing their importance. Woodblock printmaker David Bull. He is the one we should be looking up to and saying, oh my God, that conception was glorious. And I just regret that he didn't live long enough to see what humanity as a whole has come to recognize in his work. He could not have possibly ever imagined. Curator of Japanese art at the British Museum, Alfred Haft. Um, Hokusai was somebody who was constantly advancing and adapting to his own circumstances and to the circumstances around him. I mean, a person who is propelled forward and is able to move forward and around all kinds of um, obstacles. Manga and anime expert, Susan Napier. You know, he was so, he had such facility. There's a real organic quality to his pictures that I, I think is because he's so good at it. I mean, I wish I could have all his manga. I mean, I have some uh, couple of books of reproduction, but you just kind of flip through them and they're so arresting. These, these pictures are so believable. And Lego art creative lead, Fiorella Groves. Well, we have this very set Lego color palettes and that color palette is what makes Lego Lego, right? So we don't deviate from it very much. And as luck would have it, when we went to see the piece in the British Museum, it was almost an exact match. I kid you not. It was really, you know, we were high-fiving <laughs> in the area. I'm sure people around us are wondering what on earth are they doing? My name is Tatiana Seraino. Welcome to Lego Art. Let's get to know our guests, and we will be starting in Tokyo with David Bull. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Should be fun, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you're Canadian, but you've lived for more than half your life in Japan. Is that right? Yes. In fact, it's almost exactly half. I'm now 70 years old, and I came here just when I was about to become 36. So yes, you're correct. It's half and half. That means either I should uh, think about getting out of here, or conversely, think about taking citizenship, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> I guess I'm planted here now. So, <laughs> How did you end up making woodblock printing in Japan? Partway along, while I was still in Canada, I had a chance encounter with Japanese woodblock prints. I saw them on the wall one day in a gallery, and the physical object caught my interest. How is this thing made? Look at that. The way the light shines on the paper. This is a really curious object. Mm. And over a period of the next few years, I came back to it and came back to it and thought, you know, could I actually try making something like what I had seen that day on the gallery wall? Here I am now, you know, 40 years later, actually making the things, you know, to that level. That's fascinating. I can't wait to hear more about the process a bit later. Our next guest is also in Japan. Naoko Mikami, can you also tell me a bit about yourself? Okay, thank you, Tatiana. My name is Naoko Mikami. I used to lead a project called Art Curator Japan. Basically, it was some kind of an initiative to promote Japanese young artists in Taiwan. Because I was living in Taiwan at the time, and I stayed there a couple of years. And then I came back to Tokyo and the pandemic hit, so I was forced to put Art Curator Japan on standby. And nowadays, I am starting a new project called Sea Hub Japan, 
which will act as a platform that connects Japanese artists and crafts to foreign companies. Interesting. So you definitely know a lot about Japanese art. Yes. Alfred Haft from the British Museum is also an expert on that field. Welcome, Alfred. Thank you, Tatjana. Great to be speaking with you today. I am a curator of Japanese art in the Department of Asia at the British Museum. My responsibilities include researching, interpreting, sharing, and developing the British Museum's collection of Japanese prints. Thank you. And then we head across the Atlantic to talk with manga and anime expert Susan Napier. Welcome, Susan. Uh, thank you, Tatiana. I am a professor of rhetoric and Japanese at the um, Tufts University in, in the Boston, Massachusetts area. I specialize in Japanese literature and popular culture and animation, but I have wider interest in fantasy and visual media as well. I should mention my mother was an art historian, and she introduced me to Japanese art by taking me to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where I saw these incredible uh, works that the uh, Museum of Fine Arts has of, uh, in their East Asian collection. So that kind of inspired me. I've written five books and working on my sixth, and the books have been generally on uh, literature and popular culture. Uh, the one that is probably most relevant to our talk today is uh, called From Impressionism to Anime. And it is an attempt to kind of look at the fascination with Japanese culture and um, what that's meant in terms of the interconnection between Japan and the West. So let's jump to Denmark and bring in Lego art creative lead Fiorella Groves. Welcome, Fiorella. Can you also briefly introduce yourself? Hi everyone. Hi Tatiana. Thanks for having me here. I really love your work. And yes, my name is Fiorella Groves and I am the creative lead for Lego Art. Well, welcome. We're really excited to have you here today, Fiorella. Let me also take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Tatiana Kalajan Saraino. I'm an art historian with a BA in art history from St. John's College at the University of Cambridge and an MA in art history from the University of John Cabot in Rome, where I'm currently based and where I'm about to embark upon a master's in arts and culture management at Rome Business School. I run a YouTube and TikTok channel called About Art that features fast-paced content on works of art from all over the world with the aim of making art and art history accessible, fast and fresh. Today, I have the unrivaled pleasure of talking with our outstanding guests about Japanese art. Let's dive right in. We're here to talk about the amazing woodlock print, The Great Wave of Kanagawa by Hokusai, that was part of the series 36 Views of Mount Fuji. It's arguably the most reproduced artwork in history. I'd like to hear why you think this print has resonated with so many people around the world. Let's start with you, Alfred. Well, uh, briefly, in this design, Hokusai seems to have achieved an elemental presentation of universal themes. Naoko, what do you think? Well, probably it comes from the uh, way it was first introduced to the West. If you think about Europe or France in the 19th century, the academy controlled everything and young artists were looking for modern ways to paint. Hoxai's wave was introduced during those days. I guess it was so different from what the academy was promoting at the time and it probably had a huge impact on young artists. The Great Wave, the composition is very powerful and seems free from unnecessary rules at the same time. So it was very, very different from anything made in Europe at the time, I guess. It certainly was. Susan, why do you think it made such an impact around the world? So many reasons. I feel like it is, first of all, just an amazing print. Mm, just yes. artistically, it grabs you. Uh, it's it's kind of exciting. It's it's different from your traditional, you know, Japanese print or even a traditional, you know, landscape uh, picture. I mean, I was Hokusai was doing something that was also just graphically very exciting, very powerful, with this vision of the wave, and then this tiny mountain, which is Mount Fuji in the in the background. I mean, supposedly it's a view of Mount Fuji, but we're seeing it from a very unusual perspective. Uh, we're seeing the wave itself is almost um, 
animistic. Mm -hmm. It has um, in the, these kind of claws are coming out in the white caps of the wave. And it's, it's almost like a beast or there's something that's trying to grab perhaps the, these fishermen as they're, they're climbing up the wave. And so we have an animistic aspect to the wave and also just a sheer graphic uh, joy in the, this just fascinating, almost mm -hmm. abstract print. I mean, it has so many different uh, layers that you can look at. Um, also, the color, this incredible kind of symphony of blue and white to, again, create a, a really a, a work that is both almost abstract, but also instantly understandable as waves and boat and mountain. So it's, it's really quite a, a unique, uh, distinctive work of art. Absolutely. Naoko, what do you think the main takeaway for the viewer is? Mm, I'm not sure. Obviously, the perspective between the tiny Mount Fuji and the giant wave makes the composition very strong. Absolutely, especially considering that Mount Fuji in the background is the highest point in Japan, and here it's completely dwarfed by the huge cresting wave. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Actually, uh, I think there's also a quotation from someone named Susan Stewart on giantism mm. and how the giant is really something that really captures our eye. Exactly. Mm. Yes. You know, it's, it's kind of like it's, it's really different. It's also a little bit almost sublime because it's so not us. Mm. Fiorella, what are your thoughts? Well, I think this piece is so interesting because it has such an open-ended story, you know? You don't quite know how much peril these fishermen are in. And uh, did they make it back to shore? Why are they out there? And it visualizes a really human experience, I feel. Like the wave is this really massive dominating force that's crushing the boat, and yet they're still going out to sea. You know, you kind of have to ask yourself, is the wave the helping hand that's going to deliver them back to land? Or is it actually going to be something that's going to demolish them? So it creates this kind of dialogue that you have with the piece that's really, really fascinating. I think that's why it's captivated so many people. I love that. I agree with you. I think it's the human aspect of the narrative that really makes it so universal. Definitely. David, what do you think? Okay, now you're sort of moving out of my pay grade here. <laughs> I know that's an iconic picture, of course. It strikes me just as well as it strikes anybody else. But I'm not the, the man to look at this and analyze for you and say, oh yes, he's used the, the triangle twice, Mount Fuji and the wave, and it echoes and all this stuff, and it comes from the left, not from the right, blah, blah, blah. Those people talk about this. I really don't know, and honestly speaking, I don't think about it too much. It doesn't bother me. My job is to make the best physical product, the best manifestation of Hokusai's idea, to honor that tradition, and if possible, even maybe to, this might sound a bit pretentious, if possible, to even make a better version of the Great Wave than the original. And what do you think the main takeaway of the print is for a viewer? Alfred? I think there may be two main takeaways. One... Um, a forceful recognition of the power of nature, and two, perseverance through the challenges of daily life. Perseverance through the challenges of daily life. I love that. Fiorella? I think for the viewer that it's a really formidable reminder of how fragile humanity is when we're met up against the forces of nature. And here Hokusai is, you know, casting nature as this beautiful force, you know, a, an active protagonist, if you will, you know, rather than a, a mere backdrop or, or some sort of victim um, in many cases. But here it's, it's, it's this sole sort of like character in there that's really taking the main stage. That's something that's something that you can't forget walking away from this piece. Absolutely. And it's both so beautiful and so terrifying at the same time. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. I would not want to be on that boat, so um, that's for sure. Me neither, for sure. Yep. Susan? Uh, this sounds facile, but it depends on the viewer, of course. Mm. It's pretty obvious <laughs> that this is a very, very popular print. I mean, I believe it is the most single most reproduced work of art. So clearly it's speaking to a lot of people. I would say it is partly just kind of maybe beauty 
and wildness maybe would be my feeling. Mm. It, as I say, it, it's just aesthetically very, very pleasing. It works well. You can you can make it small. You can make it big. The basic design remains intact. So it's you can put it on your your cell phone as a background, or or you can you know for all I know you could you can make a tattoo of it, or uh, just put it on a uh, you know a sneaker or something. So it has that kind of the quality of. Um, of iconicity, that it's, it's reproducible, that it's powerful, and that it fits across many, many dimensions of, of art, but also popular culture, uh, that I think is, is very important. But to go back to the wildness, mm. this is not just a, a pretty little picture of a garden, you know, and flowers and things like that. There is this force in the way that is that is compelling. And it does come across no matter how small it is. I mean, that that's really something I could see it as a, as a tiny little, you know, medallion or a pendant. And you would still have that that curve, that sense of, wow, what's going to happen next? Literally, it's something that is about to crest. I mean, mm, it is, absolutely. that's what's so exciting about waves. They're not just static. They are always about to happen. So we have this you know small print this infinite possibility of something about to happen absolutely i think it's the inevitability of that wave crashing down that will translate no matter how big or small uh, the print is which is it's so timeless yeah. as you said exactly so what does the print mean to you personally fiorella what do you think about when you see it i mean after working with this piece for for quite some time um, you know, we've had lots of discussions in the team about what it means to us. And I think personally for me, it speaks to me in the sense that, you know, that there's no, there's no bounds for humanity's capacity for courage. You know, we can almost liken hockey-sized fishermen heading out to fish to NASA sending astronauts into space. You know, it's, <laughs> it's like, it's so dangerous out there. Why are you going out there? But it's an important reminder, really, that sometimes it's a worthwhile endeavor to venture further. And, you know, whether we overcome the journey or succumb to the treachery it brings, I think we still progress, right? Absolutely, yes. And I think that's what the the mountain as well uh, somehow symbolizes, the fact that it's still so stable in the background, is that reminder that Absolutely. despite the, the drama, things will uh, hopefully turn out okay. <laughs> exactly. Susan, what does it mean to you personally? Hmm. Well, I've always loved Hokusai. Uh, personally, I wish I could collect him. Uh, <laughs> I don't have that kind of money, alas. And um, I look at those fishermen and they're going to get through. In Japanese, there's a term gambaru, which means, you know, enduring, persevering, just, you know, keep going. Mm. And they're persevering against this wave, which is beautiful and amazing, but really very alien. Mm. And I like the fact that they're still gambado and they're still getting their, their boat and still going on. And I also, I do love Mount Fuji. It's so beautiful. And it does make me think of Fuji, which I've seen for so often over the years and the sense that it may be small but it's still there you know this feeling that yes there's a wave but there's also Fuji and there are human beings who are still trying to gambado still trying to persevere throughout this complex wild and crazy world I love that it leads back to how this print became so timeless and important for viewers all over the world exactly When I looked at the print for the first time, I felt that the colors seemed to create an initial sense of serenity. Mm -hmm. But the subject matter itself definitely changes that first impression. Naoko, what do you think of that? Well, I am not sure there's a serenity uh, here. <laughs> Maybe uh, it, this is a um, Western point of view. Well, for Japanese people, and especially at the time, using all that blue might have created a lot of excitement and strong sense of energy, I think. So because such shades of blue were completely new at the time. Alfred, tell us a little bit about what we are actually looking at in the print. The print is popularly called the Great Wave, but it actually has a designated title, which can be translated under the wave of Kanagawa. Kanagawa was a famous fishing ground, and the location relates specifically to the print. Here, returning from a delivery in heavy seas, three fish transport boats encounter a giant cresting storm wave that appears ready to crash down upon them, and even over Mount Fuji 
in the distance. Hokusai brings us right into the middle of the action and presents a great cliffhanger. Will the boats make it safely home? Absolutely. The Great Wave is what was known as an ukiyo-e in Japan. David, can you tell us a little bit more about what ukiyo-e prints actually were? Okay, ukiyo without the e, ukiyo, the floating world as it's generally translated, is a philosophy of a sort of a, a way to live. Just live for today, don't think about tomorrow too seriously, you know, just float through the world and you'll see what will come. The e is the word for picture. It got tacked onto this once publishers and designers started making book illustrations that depicted this kind of a floating world. And that's what ukiyo-e in its technical meaning actually means. So there's the technical academic answer. The word now has in general usage come to have a wider meaning of just Japanese pictures. Right. Now, The Great Wave is part of the series 36 Views of Mount Fuji. Alfred, can you tell us some more about this series? The series depicts Mount Fuji, Japan's most famous mountain, from a quite dazzling variety of locations and perspectives, from cities and highways, land and sea, across rivers, lakes and forests, from the tops of buildings and bridges, from the base of valleys, high and low, near and far. The title suggests a series of 36 prints, but these were apparently so well received that the publisher, Nishimuriya, commissioned another 10 designs. In an advertisement for the series, Nishimuriya promised a series in monochrome blue, but at some point the approach changed and other colors were steadily added. Hokusai scholar Roger Keyes has likened the progression to the sun rising and gradually restoring color to the world. Mm. Now, Komikami, as a Japanese art curator, what can you say about this series? Um, I find some of them are outstanding, like the Great Wave. But I also think that some of them in the series are rather ordinary works. You need to consider the fact that the, the artist are not exactly acting solo on the market. They responded to what was called a hanmoto. Hanmoto means um, publisher or producer. So even if there was a dialogue between the, the artist and the Hamoto, the publisher, had final decision for the contents of the series. So, of course, money is the center of the thing. <laughs> Hamoto always uh, wanted to create new popular series that would sell a lot. <laughs> In this series of Mount Fuji, they used the new color Prussian blue, and this would definitely be popular among buyers. Furthermore, the publisher made the artist draw images of Mount Fuji from various famous places. Uh, this is obviously another commercial trick. Sure. And we'll get back to the whole commercial aspect a bit later. But can you tell us how the other prints in the series differ to The Great Wave? Some of them are very, um, not that complex. They're too plain for me compared to The Great Wave. Yeah, some of them you cannot compare to other. <laughs> I think I have to agree with you. The dynamism that comes through this print is, uh, I think it differs greatly to the rest. There's uh, a lot more yes. um, <laughs> a sense of energy coming through, which is unrivaled, I think, compared to the others. Mm -hmm. Alfred? The prints are not numbered, so it is difficult to know the original order of publication or the sequence, if any was intended. The prints likely to be earliest are known in monochrome blue, followed by others with blue outlines and a combination of colors. The last 10 originally had black outlines and a variety of colors. Under the Wave of Kanagawa seems to stand out for its powerful narrative quality. But it was the sea view in the Great Wave that would create international interest in Japanese art, is that correct? Mm. Hokusai's published drawing manuals seem to have promoted um, initial interest in the artist and contributed to a growing interest in Japanese art. And this interest was spurred further as color prints became better known. Hokusai's skill in drawing water seems to have won special admiration from European and American collectors and art connoisseurs. Absolutely. 
Let's talk a bit about the technique. David, how do Japanese woodblock prints compare to oil on canvas paintings? Because it is different, isn't it? Oh my God, it's it's night and day. We're not <laughs> we're not even talking about the same thing at all. <laughs> Remember, the culture these prints were created in didn't have anything like oil paintings. They didn't exist over there. I know this was a completely different, separate genre. These are different cultures, different techniques, different concepts, different motivations, different results. And oil painting was, as far as I understand it, created as a thing that we would call art, A-R-T. It was done by an artist and the purpose of communicating some kind of image or some kind of image emotion to somebody else who was going to look at this thing. It was perhaps going to hang on a wall where many people could see it. It was an object of art. Now, the Great Wave and the other prints that were made back in the society in that time, they were not art. They didn't exist as art objects. Woodblock prints back then were not in any way, shape or form, and I mean zero. They were not any kind of an object that we in the West think of as being art. And this is a huge paradox. Mm. That print, the woodblock print of that wave, was just one of a group of another group of another group of prints that were just published to grab some money and get it. Let's go on and make the next one. And here now, the entire planet looks on that thing and says, this is one of the greatest art objects created by the hand of man. If Hoxai could hear you say that, he would just say like, <laughs> what are you smoking? But let me have some. <laughs> <laughs> it's a concept I cannot emphasize enough. The whole Western world back in the 1800s, when Japanese culture first started to become open to the West, you know, the year of, of after Perry opened the country and, and Japonism and stuff like this, the Western world went nuts for Japanese culture and still, to a large extent, is nuts about Japanese culture. But they see those woodblock prints as being some of the greatest art ever created by the hand of man which I actually agree with, but the people who made them would say, what? Because they were just making printed stuff. Mm. With every work of art, context can really help us better understand the subject matter and style. Naoko, can you tell me about what was happening in Japan at the time? At the time, Japan had been uh, enjoying about 200 years of peace and tremendous economic and uh, cultural boom. So the population in those days was very optimistic about the future and the situation in life, I would say. Tokyo, which was then called Edo, had a population of over one million people and was thus, I think, the largest city in the world at that time. The city infrastructure was quite advanced with very high hygiene condition. The literacy level of people was also very high and the cultural life was vibrant there. And there was no political tension yet although the situation will slowly degrade during the next decades. Fantastic. And so the Great Wave was made just on the, the precipice of change, mm, if you will. Yes. Or there's a feeling that imminent change is about to occur, perhaps coming through the print itself. Yes, absolutely. Did the fact that Japan was closed and isolated from the outside world have an impact on the way Japanese art evolved at this time? Of course, during the Sakoku period, uh, Sakoku means closed country, which lasted a bit more than 200 years. Japan did not completely stop the influx of foreign culture. There was still in Japan what was called Rangaku, or Dutch studies, which studied art, technologies, and philosophies that were coming from Europe. Also, the culture of mainland China was still finding its way to Japan. So Japan was not completely closed. However, the isolation policy played reducing the influx of foreign cultures to the minimum. And because of that, there was more and more for the for distinctive standalone Japanese culture to evolve and mature 
borrowing less and less on ideas imported from China. So I think that one of the reasons why the Great Wave is so special is because it offers us such a privileged insight into the lifestyle, the culture, and the mentality of Japan at the time. Would you agree on that? I agree that the whole series of the six, uh, 36 views of Mount Fuji gives us an amazing insight about what Japanese life looked back then. But if you really want to know the inside, you should check Hokusai Manga. Susan, as a manga and anime expert, now we're moving into your area of expertise. First of all, can you just explain the difference between manga and anime? Manga are um, basically print and anime was moving, <laughs> moving pictures. And so, I mean, that's that's a very, very important difference that you have on film, something that's moving and, and transforming. Um, having said that, manga can be pretty powerful too. And But with anime, you have uh, the sound also and the movement. And of course, you know, more and more really from certainly the 1970s on, you know, very sophisticated techniques of animation, really beautiful. I mean, most manga artists are artists who are, have had artistic training. Mm -hmm. They're coming in. They really know how to create beautiful images. And then the anime directors and anime, the animators are also, you know, well-versed in art history and, and, their, and the way to create beautiful images. I mean, you kind of keep wanting to watch it. Can you tell us a little bit more about how did Hokusai sort of uh, introduce uh, manga? Well, they the story is that um, he had been pretty successful and he ended up, you know, being very, very well known. But at this point in the, I think it was 1814 that uh, the first manga is published. And I believe it was his publisher that sort of said, well, you know, why don't we publish a book? And Hokusai was definitely known. I mean, he was born in 1760. Mm -hmm. So by the time he's doing manga, he has an established reputation. He's in his 50s. He has a good publisher. He wasn't apparently necessarily all that excited himself, but money is money. <laughs> so, you know, uh, he'd been doing sketches. I mean, he's an artist. He sketches just of all different kinds of things. Mm. And they put it together in a book and it did very well. And so, great. Uh, suddenly he becomes much more interested in publishing this um, this kind of thing. And it, there are at least 12 that were published during his lifetime. And it was lucrative and it was probably, you know, rather fun. Mm. I mean, here's a brilliant artist who's just enjoying himself doing his sketches and um, making money. I mean, that's what what could be better? <laughs> and speaking of their success, these images, I think initially they were just meant for students. Yes. Yeah. They were originally, so thank you for putting that. Yeah, they were originally to, to, you know, learn to draw, how to learn to draw, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. And we still, it's so sweet because we still have these manga books now. I'm sure you're aware of them, you know, very, very available, very ubiquitous mm -hmm. for people see manga and anime and they think, cool. You know, I'd like to do that. And so it's very nice that 100 and, well, almost 200 years later, people are still learning to draw manga and still doing sketches and, and having fun with this. So as well as being um, accessible and entertaining, as you said, these images, they also give us a peek into the Japanese people and what their life in Japan was like at the time. Oh, absolutely. And again, that was one of the revolutionary aspects about them, mm -hmm. because up until that point, even in Japan, uh, there wasn't a, that much fascination with kind of regular people. And so you're able, he's able to draw very distinctive looking people who look like real human beings engaged in all kinds of activities. And I think, again, sort of go back to this idea of movement, there, there's a lot of sense of lightness and, mm -hmm. and movement across the pages, if you look at the manga, and people are doing they're fishing or they're dancing or they're playing games or card games or just jumping around or doing silly things, you know, celebrating something. And not just people, but you have animals and you have uh, very strange, grotesque animals. <laughs> so it's not just um, the ordinary people of Japan, but Hokusai's manga are everything. They're a world of everything. He's doing occupations, you know, a, um, a barrel maker, a sake maker, but also it's a water wider world of the supernatural, which in a way is something that would have been considered part of the world, definitely, mm, uh, the real world in the 1830s. I mean, there's a definite sense of, of animistic forces as, as part of Japanese culture that was accepted. Were there any humorous drawings among them? 
Yeah. I mean, they're often very humorous, but they're not necessarily slapstick. Mm. It's not like people slipping on banana peels, per se. <laughs> it's not quite that kind of, you know, comic humor that we might see uh, in the West. It's more just, I would call it lighthearted, maybe a little bit frivolous, although working, you know, it's, I mean, the idea is that people are, are enjoying their life. And that's the impression I've always gotten from this period, that it was a very really unusual period in, in world history and for any country. They, they were set, cut off from the rest of the world for 260 years, pretty much. And they developed this very interesting culture, which I say is very urban, very uh, mercantile. Mm -hmm. And at least for the people who were part of it, it clearly was, uh, there was a, uh, a sense of, of joy, um, kind of uh, intransience. And so uh, to me, again, to go back to the question of humor, it's more a large humor, a kind of broad humor, a sense of, you know, aren't people amazing? Aren't they, you know, sort of fun and silly? And, you know, isn't this world an amazing place? And, you know, we should kind of appreciate it while it continues, while it floats by. And, and I suppose also the way they kind of appear, the way you're describing the nature of these uh, manga, uh, this world that encapsulated everything, you know, the humor, the banality, the, yeah. Mm, that's good. Banality is banality, good too. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's often just regular stuff. Absolutely. You know? mm. Just regular stuff that, that somehow becomes special. And they're so arresting. These, these pictures are so believable. You know these people, but but beautifully encapsulated. And what else can you tell us about these drawings? Is there anything else that comes to, to mind? Um, I guess I would, I mean, you know, I work on fantasy, so I can't help but, you know, be so impressed by the fantastic uh, images. I mean, I love his dragons. Dragons are great, just generally. And, um, <laughs> and if you go to um, Kyoto, you'll see that often a temple will have a, a dragon on its roof, on a ceiling. And the reason is that in the West, we have fire-breathing dragons. But in East Asia, the dragon um, is a water spirit. And you have a, um, a dragon on your ceiling in a temple in order to help prevent fire. Mm. And, of course, they're an incredibly delightful thing to draw. And we certainly have them in the West with St. George and the dragon. Mm. But, you know, the, the Japanese... Um, artists were, were really kind of could go to town on them. Mm -hmm. And they're so lively in Hokusai's sketches. You can just imagine them flapping their tails or, <laughs> you know, flying or something. And just generally, he has um, his ability to do the grotesque and the supernatural, which I do think is, is very important in, in modern manga as well. That I would say that's a definite connection there, uh, really worth looking at. Thank you, Susan. He really sounds like a playful character. Now, I'd like to hear more about how the actual woodblock prints are made. And David, I believe that you have made about 2,000 prints of the Great Wave. Is that right? Okay, when you say me, we got to qualify this right away. It's never one person's job. Uh, Designers designed, carvers carved, printers printed, and it was all sewn together, wrapped together by a producer, you know, the man who was the publisher. It may have been more, four jobs, the publisher, the carving team, the printing team, and the designer. Those four people together were responsible for it. So to your answer your question, have I made X thousand copies of The Great Wave? I have cut the blocks for the version that our workshop is publishing. I have not printed a single one of the ones that we have sold. I did some of the test printing, but once we got it organized, I passed it over to our professional team, and over you go, guys. Get Busy. Can you take us through the process of making a print from the artist having done the drawing? So let's say Hokusai has just made the drawing of the Great Wave. How many people then get involved and what do they each do? Most projects started with a publisher coming up with the idea for something he wanted to produce and sell. Most projects started with the publisher. Okay, I see the guy down the street. He's selling those new designs by Hiroshige, those landscapes of the Tokaido. They're selling so well. Maybe we should make some kind of a similar project. And he might say, what could we do? I know, I saw some landscapes by that Hokusai guy. Let's see if we can call him up and see if he's free and he can do some landscapes for us. Let's chat with him. So he gets a hold of Hokusai, calls him in. He would never go to visit Hokusai. He'd call him in. One of his henchmen would go out there and say, Mr. Publisher wants to chat with you. Have you got some free time? Hokusai might say, yeah, okay, I'll go and talk to him. Let's see what we can do. 
And the publisher would outline to Hokusai the concept that he had in mind. Let's do some big landscapes, the ones that match what Hiroshige is doing right now. But instead of Tokaido, let's do a theme. Let's show all of Mount Fuji because it's really hot in the market. People love pictures of Mount Fuji. Maybe we can have a five or six or maybe ten of them in the set or something like this. He would, he would, you know, uh, brainstorm this or, or just, you know, put an idea on the table. And Hokusai might say, well, okay, but I'm busy with the commission right now for a couple of screens, but I'll be free in maybe two weeks, uh, you know. Can we talk about it? And the guy will say, yeah, bring me some sketches when you're ready. Now, I'm making this all up, but this is the way that it worked. We, we know sure. the system, how it worked. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so some time goes by and Hokusai brings in a few sketches for the guy. It was a guy. There was no women in any of these projects. I'm sorry, it's all going to be men involved in this whole thing here because these were working people. Women were at home doing female things and men had jobs. So it's always going to be guys here. The publisher says, Okay, yeah, that looks good. That's what I had in mind, yeah. Tell you what, though, these have a bit too many people. I know most of your work involves really close-ups of people. I know, I know, I know. But the thing I have in mind here, I want to really think about the wide landscape. I know you want to do the people, but I want to do the wide landscape. So take these things, go back, and let's, you know, can you, like, fix them? <laughs> So Hokusai grumbles, but he's broke, maybe. Whatever, he does need work. You know, he's got to make a living. He's already spent the money that he got for that screen painting we talked about, you know, two, two weeks ago, whatever. So he goes back, he does some more sketches, brings them in. The publisher says, this is what I want. Yes, good, good, good. This is, I want the landscape, the big wide open spaces, the big sky. I want that mountain. Good, good, good. So I've been thinking about this some more and I knew you could do it. We're going to expand it. We're going to do 12 in the series. And how about this? If we paid you, it would be, and he'd name a number, and Hokusai would say, is that all? And the guy would say, well, you know, they had the negotiation, blah, 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 blah. And they'd come to their deal about doing this. So Hokusai goes back to his workroom, and he sketches some more, draws some more, sketches some more. Now, we don't have any idea how much back and forth there was. The publisher sends him home again. He brings him again, sends him home again. We don't know. But at some point, it could be early in the process, it could be late, there's a deck of sketches there. And the publisher says, my God, look at this. This is really kind of cool. We can use this. Okay, then let's do it. Let's call the series 36 Views of Fuji. Because look at this. You add 10 more and we'll do this. And, and he gets excited and says, we're going to do this. He calls his men over and says, look at this. We're going to have a real good series here. And they make their deal and away they go. Now, production starts, but Hokusai at this point is actually almost already finished. He's presented sketches that show the mountain and a couple of guys in front of it with a horse and whatever, and the publisher's team now takes over. And they can now put this into a square format. They will draw border lines. They will put in the cartouche. The publisher's decided the name. It's going to say Sanju Roke, Toka, the 36. The publisher's team does this. Now, they might go back to Hokusai and say, look, the sketch of this horse is a bit rough. Can you clean it up? And Hokusai will clean up a horse and give it to them. And they paste that in to the picture. And bit by bit by bit, the 36 views come together like this. And probably the first few start carving while they were still already starting to make the next ones in the batch. Maybe they haven't even got the designs for the last bunch ready yet, but they're already carving the first ones because the publisher knows what he wants and he wants to get going on this. And it's the team then takes over. The carver, he knows what to do. He's seen Hokusai's work before. He's got a copy of the manga in his workshop. Hokusai, by this point, is a very, very, very experienced person. His work is all over town. The carvers have all done some of his stuff before. The printers have all done some of his stuff before. They know what colors are in fashion right now. Mm. They know what a current woodblock print is supposed to look like. They know the mood that's happening right now in town. They get busy cutting and printing. And Hokusai isn't really actually needed much anymore. And that's kind of a shocking thing to many people. They assume that Hokusai is hovering over every step of every stage of every one of these prints. And almost certainly that's not the case. He's busy with his next job. So when it comes to the designer who in this case was Hokusai, I think what I understand is that he actually has very little say in the actual design and is not needed for most of the process. The prints we're looking at here, the Great Wave and that series, sketches, yes, from Hokusai. 
touch-up sketches, more clearly defined lines from Hokusai, yes. Later on, what colors we should use, perhaps there was some input. Most of the prints that I've studied in that series, I think, do not really demand input from Hokusai anymore. And I suspect that his later involvement in the project was perhaps not so extensive. But there are people out there who would really vigorously argue this point with me mm. and say, no, the fact that that great wave has become such an iconic thing, it's proof in itself that the master himself had a hand in this and called for every dot and line to be just as they are. I don't have any proof. There's no journals or letters or documentation from the era back there. But I do have one technical point hidden inside that great wave that tells me that the design we now see, the wave at the left, the boats at the front, the iconic mountain in the background, the dark sky gradation behind Mount Fuji, that was not Hokusai's idea. Mm -hmm. When he handed it in and when the group first made it, it didn't have that gradation behind the mountain because that gradation was put later on on one of the other blocks and it causes an ink stain on one of the other blocks that we can see in original versions of this print. The gradation at the back was not originally there and somewhere along the line, the publisher or one of his printers said, geez, that mountain, it's kind of bare. Tell you what, let's put a gradation and try it. They tried it. Oh my God, that's it. Let's do this. Let's roll. But that wasn't Hoxai's idea. So can you take us through the different stages of actually carving the, the work of art, which I suppose is your field of expertise? Well, the reproduction we made, yes, I carved every stroke of it and I very heavily documented this on YouTube as well. There's uh, one important thing to distinguish between back in the old days and what I do now and the other people living now, what we do when we're making reproductions. And it's a hugely important point which most people would never think of. The original carver, the carver of the original version, and David here, the carver of his reproduction, had completely different jobs. Now think about this. The original version carver, he was carving Hokusai's lines as either Hokusai drew them or as one of the publisher's minions cleaned them up and sketched them. So a pen drawing, a Japanese brush drawing on thin paper was pasted down onto the wood and the carver said, okay, I can take this from here. Let me go. So the carver is now carving humanly created brush strokes. Dave here and all the other carvers who are working here these days, we don't have hook size original brushstrokes. They were destroyed at the moment that that original version was carved because that sketch and the drawing was pasted on the wood. What we are doing is we are carving a reproduction of the woodblock print that was made that month. In other words, we're reproducing carved lines. So we have no decisions to make. Our job is to copy what we see with no interpretation because we're cutting a line that's already been cut. The original carver, the original cutter, was looking at that and saying, oh, look at that, I can clean that up. And he cleaned it up and he turned the brushed, sometimes very messy, sometimes very ragged brush strokes, he turned them into clean, crisp, carved lines. Mm, yeah. And my job now is to look at the best of the old carving mm. and to try, as well as I can, to replicate it. But I don't have the chance to do what the old carver did and cut Hokusai's original lines because they are lost and gone forever. Mm, interesting. Okay, then the woodblock is made and the printing begins. But there's another interesting fact. The first prints might look different than the later prints. Tell me why that is. Now there's the woodblock. You've got this thing. The carver has done a good job. Let's say he's done a really nice job at reproducing Hokusai's lines, at creating new, new carved lines for Hokusai. The block is done. There it goes. Now, from a fresh, clean block, if we print it carefully, we get good, clean, sharp, nice lines. Take another copy. Mm, still good, clean, sharp lines. Take 5,000 copies, rubbing this with ink and rubbing this with ink and doing this and the block splits and the block gets older. Obviously, this block now starts to degrade the more copies you pull from it. And there's a huge, huge paradox involved here that is wonderfully interesting. 
the publisher, as I mentioned before, he's trying to sell a ton of copies of this. Okay, he gets the blocks all finished for this print, puts it in his shop, and let's see what happens. And oh my God, it starts to sell well. Now, they had maybe run off 100 copies or 200 copies in the room upstairs. No idea. If he was uh, optimistic it was going to sell, he might run off a lot of copies. If he wasn't sure about this one, he wouldn't waste money. He'd run off 20 copies and let's do a trial run and see if it sells well. We have no idea. He probably knew this was going to be a good seller because he could see it was a good design. So let's say 200. They make their 200 copies, put them in the shop. Bang, 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 bang. They start to sell. Oh my God, we've got a home run. Oh my God, oh my God. The publisher calls upstairs to their printers. We got a good one. Get those blocks out. 200 more copies right now, as fast as you can. And the printer yells downstairs, boss, the blocks are still wet. If I start right now and start a new batch, they're going to really start to get worn out. They need to be dried out properly. And the publisher says, I don't care about that. This is hot. People want it right now. We're going to be sold out of this thing in 15 minutes. Okay, boss, they're your blocks. They're going to wear out. And So the paradox here is the best-selling woodblock prints of the day the ones we are most likely to have copies left over these days were the ones that were made quickly in multiple quantities, mm -hmm. fast again and again and again from blocks that didn't have a chance to dry out, didn't have a chance to wait, and the blocks were abused because we got to get going on this. And the prints that didn't sell well in the shop, these are the ones almost always in perfect, beautiful condition because they only made 50 copies and didn't make any more. The blocks that went into the stove because nobody was going to use them again. So the prints we have the most copies left are the ones almost always we see in the worst possible condition. It's a terrible paradox, but it's just the nature of the commerce that was involved back in the day. Yeah, what a paradox. I've never thought about that. Now, David, as far as I understand, you have an exciting project coming up with the British Museum. Please tell me a little bit about that. Partway along through this talk today, we talked about the fact that all of us carvers, me and the other carvers working in this, we never get a chance to do the thing that the first editions of carvers did, to carve real hook-sized lines and to not to step in and do our own interpretation of them, but to just do our job, take our turn into trying to do a good job, take this master guy's lines and do as well as we can at making them dance and sing on the page as well as we can. You know, mm. We have to sometimes simplify it because he just put a gray blob where the hair was. We have to carve the hair lines because he didn't show us one by one by one. So we have to interpret this master's work. But next year, I am going to have a chance to do exactly this thing that I'm describing. Because in some museums here and there around the world, there are collections of Hoksai drafts and quite well-developed sketches, which for commercial reasons didn't get turned into finished projects. In other words, he did his part, may or may not have been paid for it, and the publisher maybe took the thing and said, okay, we'll get to this next didn't get to it next. And those sketches ended up being preserved in modern institutions. Next year, I am going to do exactly the thing that I have described to you in this talk. I am going to get a chance to take Hoxai's original sketches, which were taken right to the stage of being given to the carver. Now, we don't have the exact paper. We're not going to destroy the paper that's in the museum. But these days, we have photocopy machines. We photocopy that thing, mm -hmm. pre prepared on thin paper. And I'm going to take those scraps of paper, paste them on a wood block, and I am going to be faced with the same challenge wow. that Egawa Tomikichi, Hokusai's favorite carver, I'm going to be faced with the same challenge that he had back in 18, 20, 18, 25, 18, 30. I'm going to sharpen my knife and dig into a Hokusai sketch and try and create a woodblock print that that guy would say, yeah, this kid knows what he's doing. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to add about the process? Part of the thing that we're trying to present to people here is to honor the craftsman, the publisher and the craftsman. They're the people whose names are gone. All we know now is the name Hoksai. So my sort of take on this, and it may be too much one-sided, I'm sorry. I want to try and, and bring forward the carver did a glorious job, the printer. Oh my God, they were so good at this. The publisher's idea. So I tend to toss aside Hoksai. He doesn't need my help because his name is world famous. But of course, at 
at heart, he's the reason we are doing this today. That publisher did lots of projects, which we are not talking about. Those carvers and printers, they were busy with lots of stuff that we are not looking at. Why are we here today? Because that man was an incredible, glorious genius whose name will, I hope, live as long as human beings have any interest in looking at this sort of thing. He is the one we should be looking up to and saying, oh my God, that conception was glorious. And I just regret that he didn't live long enough to see what humanity as a whole has come to recognize in his work. He could not have possibly ever imagined completely impossible. Now let's turn to the sky. Alfred Haft, why do you think that Hokusai and his team used the composition of the sky that they did? Well, that's very interesting because um, the sky is not very often um, identified as a point of interest in this print. Most of the time it's the boats and the waves. Um, But for me, the treatment of the clouds animates the area above the main action of the print and perhaps contributes to the sense of turbulence. Mm. Naoko, what do you think? Ah, the sky thing. This sky looks very different from version to version, edition to edition. Hmm. Speaking of the sky and European influence, Hokusai has painted a low horizon in these prints, and that was not so common in Japanese art at the time. Is that right? Hmm. You can find low horizons in other ukiyo-e art. So I would not say it's uncommon, but it's true that it's not the most used perspective either. Anyway, I think it's just another trick by Hokusai to put even more pressure on the people on the board. Right. So in this case, you're saying that the low horizon is used to kind of magnify the power of the wave and make it feel even more threatening. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I agree Mm -hmm. with you for sure. I think another powerful aspect of this woodblock is Hokusai's use of scale. Alfred, what can you tell me about that? Um, As he did occasionally in other prints in the series, Hokusai here depicts Mount Fuji, the tallest mountain in Japan, as though it might be swamped and erased by a sea wave. The inversion of scale is one of the most surprising aspects of the design, but even so, the mountain seems to anchor the composition, as though no matter how small and distanced it will remain an immovable feature of the landscape and a cultural lodestar. The inversion heightens the narrative tension of the scene, but also implies further associations and resonances regarding the sacredness of the mountain. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, totally. Mount Fuji is basically the tallest and the biggest thing you can find in Japan. On the contrary, the wave of Kanagawa is supposed to depict a place somewhere around Tokyo Bay. And Tokyo Bay is a place where waves are normally small. Um, So what Hokusai actually does here is taking the tallest and the smallest thing you can find in Japan and then reversing their importance Here, the wave completely dwarfs the mountain. That shows the power of the sea and power of nature. And the poor people on the boats, they are caught between the two elements with nowhere to escape. (laughs) So what does Mount Fuji symbolize? Well, Mount Fuji has been considered as a sacred mountain in Shinto since at least the 7th century, and there are many temples and shrines around it. And climbing this mountain has long been a religious act. The name Fuji itself can be read as a pan and can mean something like the most unique or immortal. Um, I'm not a religious person, but for some reason, I always feel happy when I see Mount Fuji in the distance on a clear winter morning. I don't know why, but maybe it's coded inside Japanese people's DNA, I guess. (laughs) And is it fair to say that for Hokusai himself, Mount Fuji was almost kind of a personal spiritual obsession? 
Mm, I think so, because he, he was living in the Edo period. There is a um, religion called Edoko, and they really wanted to uh, go to Fuji and climb there. People are very, um, yeah, worship the mountain at the Mount Fuji. So I think so, Hokusai did. As Susan mentioned earlier, Hokusai's The Great Wave is perhaps the most reproduced artwork in history. Not only have there been many prints made, but today you can see it as wall posters in bars, restaurants, and homes around the world. You can get it as a stick-on skin for PlayStation game controllers. It can be seen as huge murals on walls, on laptop cases, sneakers, and t-shirts. The wave has also become a popular tattoo, especially among surfers, and it's even been turned into an official emoji on the iPhone. Try typing the word wave and just see what happens. And now you can build it with Lego art. So let's bring back Lego art creative lead Fiorella Groves to hear more about how that happened. Welcome back, Fiorella. Hi, Tatiana. So first of all, I'd like to get to know you a little better, Fiorella. Mm -hmm. How did you end up working at the Lego Group, what many Lego fans around the world would consider a dream job? Well, <clears throat> my story about how I got designing Lego sets is a little bit different from other Lego designers uh, in that I'm not a Lego builder to begin with and neither did I grow up playing with Lego. But I do have over 18 years experience in a design industry rooted in graphic design, art direction and an insatiable desire to learn, of course. And I actually started my Lego career in 2016, working way behind the scenes <laughs> of Lego sets, actually, primarily focusing on how we stimulate creativity in the design organization. And then one day I was in the area and in 2019, an opportunity came up to join the Lego art team. So I seized the opportunity because not only is art a personal passion, but I was also really excited to apply my design experience and see how we could push the limits of what a Lego brick can do as an artistic medium on this product. And the rest, as I say, is history. Mm. So your title is Creative Lead. What is your role on a project like this? Well, my role as a creative lead is to create a brief and set a vision that the designers can design to. And it's definitely teamwork. It's a really close and collaborative process that requires a lot of back and forth um, and rich dialogue between myself and the designers in order to create a really awesome Lego set. So in this set, it means I get to work with a host of incredibly talented creatives. I'm very, very lucky. So from the Lego model designers, and shout out to Milan and Nico and Anna Meadow, those were the designers who worked on this set. And a really big shout out to Diego. We have a graphic designer who worked on this set too. And then we have Peter, our building instruction specialist. And then we also have Pia, our, our beloved model coach. And so the process for this is slightly different um, in the sense that Milan and Nico's involvement was that they made they actually made a really cool concept uh, in their own spare time. Oh. And then they left it hanging in the Lego art area without explanation. So it was one of those moments where I was like, what is this? <laughs> what is this? And we were just in the process of, you know, really trying to look for ways to evolve the Lego art line mm. and, you know, find ways to exemplify how we can use the brick as a really, really key artistic medium. And here was this piece. It was quite rough at the time, um, but it really stood out. So they left it there without explanation. And then <laughs> our third designer, Anna Meta knocked it out of the park by taking their concept to the next level and made it buildable. <laughs> because I think a lot of times when Lego designers build, they build for themselves and the sense mm. that they just want to get the visuals out really quickly. And then we figure out afterwards, you know, in the process, how to make it buildable in a step-by-step -step process and make it enjoyable for the consumers to build as well. Mm. And then I can go on. There's our graphic designers, of course. There's our building experience specialists. There's our model coaches. And then there's 
everyone else as part of the chain where it's from designing box covers, graphics on the building instructions, and then of course supply chain, it goes on and on. So it can easily pass through hundreds of hands. So my job is to make sure that the creative direction is clear, that we're working in sync to the same vision, and that we've really pushed the creative boundaries to make every Lego art set an extraordinary creative experience. Fantastic. So you're almost in a way like Hokusai's publisher or producer that gets a great team <laughs> and then oversees that everything is perfect, right? <laughs> yeah, well, if you'd like to put it that way. I love the sound of that. Can I <laughs> can I have that as my job title? Hokusai's producer. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> um, so there's still a lot of interest for Japanese art in general. And of course, most of all, for the one that we're talking about today, Hokusai's The Great Wave. Mm -hmm. What is it about this print that makes it so unique that it deserves its own Lego art piece? Oh, wow. It's a really great question because when we look at the this masterpiece, you know, we look at all those layers of color, the graphical shapes and textures, and they immediately spoke to us as something that could translate really nicely into Lego bricks. And Hokusai has captured this beautifully rough and turbulent ocean. It's an extremely emotional piece. But as a design challenge, we had to ask ourselves, how could the shapes and textures of Lego pieces be used to accentuate those ideas and capture that expression and that emotion? And that made for a really interesting design experience for the team. You know, the layering of the Lego plates in order to create the shapes by necessity becomes three-dimensional. So we needed to imagine what Hokusai's vision might have looked like in three dimensions. And so we have this really funny situation here where we're creating something that's three dimensional from a two dimensional piece. And the original artist had created something two dimensional from a three dimensional vision. <laughs> <laughs> What a fantastic paradox. Am I right in saying that you also visited the British Museum to talk with Alfred himself? Yes, we did. And it was such a pleasure. We went to visit the British Museum when they had the Great Wave on exhibition. And it was an amazing show. Um, we took the opportunity to have a conversation with Alfred. We had the full design team online to ask him all the questions because we were just in that point in the design development where we were really kind of struggling with some elements. How do we, you know, do we include the cloud? Do we not? And of course, having those conversations with Alfred just cleared everything up for us. Of course, we needed to include the cloud. Mm -hmm. Of course, we needed to make sure that the claws of the waves were defined. And the original concept model had little frogs on the sea foam instead of birds, as we have now. Ah. Yeah, and it's because we understood that, you know, Hokusai had an appreciation, a deep appreciation for nature. So we wanted to make sure that we had some organic shapes and utilize the full spectrum of the Lego elements we have to um, recreate that dimensionality of the sea foam. Mm. And that, you know, we have these kind of slightly spiky sort of textures coming out from the piece. And after speaking with Alfred, we realized that frogs were not the way to go. It was actually birds. Mm. And he was able to show us a drawing that Hokusai had made where there was a wave, almost like the great wave in itself. And in the background, there was this spread of birds in the distance that almost looks like sea spray. And it is that sort of beautiful sort of dialogue that he has with nature to depict how it works and how it forms in his mind. Oh, fantastic. What an amazing experience that must have been. Uh, and speaking of the, the the foam of the wave, which you were just mentioning, I've noticed mm -hmm. looking at, the, at the, the Lego design that a bit of spray from the wave actually extends beyond the confines of the work and spills into the frame. It's such a wonderful detail that I think really captures the, the dynamism of the wave. Can you tell us a bit about that uh, little detail and how you chose to kind of uh, incorporate that? Of course. Um, when we worked on the piece, you know, Anna Menno and I had a lot of conversation about how we can make this really come to life. My big push was for us to really make this different from a printed piece. Why it would make sense to have a Lego Hokusai piece as opposed to a printed one. And one of the things we really wanted to capture was to really make his wave come to life a bit more. And Anamela then added these subtle touches of like, you know, turning the leaves a little bit more so it broke yeah. mm. the lines of the frame a little bit was just a really, really nice, elegant touch to really accentuate that, to show that this is a piece that's coming out at you. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, so for the first Lego art sets, you were only using small round one by one bricks. In this one, however, you are using many other kinds. Can you tell me a little bit about why you decided to do that? Yes, of course. Well, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, like, you know, we really wanted to evolve the Lego art product line and find a way to exemplify the use of the Lego brick as an artistic medium. Mosaics are one way to do so, but just like in art, there are just so many other ways to create expression. And so we started exploring how different Lego elements can capture emotions and details of an artwork. Mm. Just a side note as well is that we haven't completely abandoned the mosaics um, because in fact here in the background, we've used it to great effect. Um, the original concept sketch that we had from Milan and Nico didn't actually have the mosaic in there. Okay. And it didn't actually feature the cloud. But after our conversations with Alfred, we realized that we really needed to feature that in there. But with normal Lego plates on there, it started to compete with the wave. And so we were really struggling to kind of find the right distinction between the wave and the cloud that's mimicking its shape. And that's when Animetta came up with this brilliant solution to solve this by having the mosaic in the background, which in contrast to the defined graphical shapes mm. that the waves created, just casted this very elegant feeling of distance that the mosaic can create. So you almost have to squint a little bit at it and it's slightly blurry. It creates a really, really beautiful visual effect. Uh, so the first sets were 2D, but this is a little bit different. Tell me a bit more about it being 3D. Um, that aside from the challenge of differentiating the shape of the wave with the cloud in the background, I think another thing that is really interesting to talk about here is that we actually considered how the shapes of these pieces related to the woodblock printing process. So you have all these different layers here and we really, really did explore how we could layer the piece so it's almost as if you would use it like block print in itself. We did explore it, but we had to prioritize the visual results because we couldn't actually get it to work uh, eventually. But it would be amazing to see how this set would look, right? If it mm. was done as if you could would block it. And <laughs> could we see what this would look like, David? <laughs> I'm going to throw this challenge out to you. Like, could that happen? That would be amazing. I would so love to see that. <laughs> What other challenges did you face when making the Lego art set? Um, I think other challenges that we face, I think it's, you know, when we're trying to recreate a masterpiece, mm. <laughs> um, something that's so beloved, it's always going to be a bit of a challenge, you know, to really faithfully recreate the likeness with Lego elements is always going to be hard and especially with organic shapes. But I believe, and I hope you agree, that our designers have really knocked it out of the park with this one. You know, at this size, everything from recreating the sea foam to the graphical depiction of the fishermen's faces had to be simplified to mm. quite a pure form, but not so much that you can no longer recognize what it is. So, you know, I have to say, from working with this piece for quite some time now, We've hung it up in our area and every time people walk past it, it's a real sort of, it's got this kind of non-Lego, Lego aesthetic yep. to it that people don't realize it's made out of Lego until they walk up close and go, oh my gosh, you've made this piece out of like leaves. You've got this made out of like little birds. Oh, wow. And it's really, it's a joy to get that impression from people. Oh, that's amazing. So speaking of the size, is what you created the same size as the original print? Yeah, I mean, actually, the original size of the piece is was remarkably kind to the Lego building system. Mm. I think Milan and Nico had done their research relatively well, and they kind of mapped it all out and found out that with this size, it worked pretty well to the Lego system that we have. And so the elements that we have just kind of lended itself rather well to the shapes that we needed to create. So that in itself wasn't too much of a challenge, I believe. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, was there any difficulty in having to capture and recreate all the very minuscule details that we see in the original print? Yeah, I think there were some aspects where we had to give way to the Lego system. Mm. And I think that there is also some charm in that as well, yes. is mm. that it is using a medium that's very distinctive 
And even with the graphic design, you know, the faces on the fishermen's faces were worthy of some discussion actually for some time with Diego because it's like, how realistic do we go? And then when we went really realistic and very sort of one-to-one to the original piece, I started to lose the Lego aesthetic. So we had to kind of, you know, he came up with a great solution on how we can strike the balance. But but yeah, there were lots of details in there that, you know, we had to kind of forego and actually give way to the Lego system because it still needed to have that tactility as well. Mm, yeah. It is such a beloved print that means so much to so many people. And it must have been monumental pressure to get it just right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it was a pressure on me, even more pressure on the designers. <laughs> and, you know, I think we'd all be lying if we didn't feel the pressure. Um, I mean, again, this is such a beautiful piece. We really, really wanted to make sure we did it justice, that we were faithful to his vision as best we can. And after our conversation with, with Alfred, we also realised that Hokusai was actually quite a character. He had quite a great sense of humour as well. So that was really, really wonderful to know. So we knew that he would appreciate some of the fun details in there of having the birds and the leaves and all these funny little quirks in the build that I hope he would appreciate. I think he really would have. He was such a playful and fun character. He had all these uh, sort of quirky mannerisms. I wish I could have met him in real life. And I wish he could have seen what you created. I think, as you said, he would have loved (laughs) these little uh, added details, for sure. Absolutely. The most eye-catching feature of the print is, of course, the Great Wave itself, which is about to engulf the three boats of terrified fishermen with its ominous claws. It's both incredibly beautiful and incredibly terrifying. Now, Aqua, what can you tell us about the wave itself? What does it symbolize? The wave is a symbol of power. Interestingly, many samurai used a wave as their emblem on their kamon. Come on is a family crest. So every uh, samurai has different come on, actually. And they like to use the wave as their emblem because it's so powerful, I guess. Wow, that's great. I had no idea. Alfred, what can you add to this? Um, waves are a powerful natural force that have a place across Japanese design. The large wave here seems to suggest um, the only way I can phrase it is to suggest something unleashed and just to leave it in a general sense like Mm. that. So speaking of the actual uh, Great Wave in itself, uh, I've always wondered why the fishermen in the small boats Mm. would go out fishing on a day like that. It's obviously very dangerous. Is that something that you've thought about? Do you think that it's realistic? (laughs) David? Well, I myself don't think about it because, again, I am just the wood carver. I don't think about these, but I have, of course, seen the different conversations because there's endless discussion about this. Of course, why were these people out there? Mm. And there are people who have analyzed this in terms of we are looking from the east. You know, if Edo, Tokyo Bay, we now call it, would be on the right-hand side of this picture, we are looking from the east towards Mount Fuji. These boats are going out into the open ocean on a day when obviously boats would not normally go out there. What are these guys doing? There's also more people in the boats than there would normally be. We can see a group of rowers in each boat, and there are also passengers in each boat. Ah. Now, this could be just Hokusai, just drawing stuff without thinking about it. Or it could be that there's a real meaning. And there's two interpretations. One is these passengers have really got to get to destination where they're going. Maybe it's Atami or Shizuoka, or maybe, well, they wouldn't go to Osaka in a small boat like that. Maybe it's Oshima. These passengers really want to get where they're going quickly. So they have paid these guys, look, let's go. The rowers say, not in this weather. Here, let me pay you. Let's go. Okay, if it's worth it to you, out we go. Theory B is that these are actually small-scale fishing boats, and those passengers are just crew. They're going to rotate. Sometimes they're going to row, sometimes they're going to throw nets out. We've got the group of rowers and the group of workers. And what they are, they are people going out early in the season, earlier than you would normally go, and they are going to try and get the fish we know as bonito. Okay. And the first boats that get back to Edo, to the fish market, with the first catch of the season, these are the boats that 
get the big bucks. And we see this still happening now with fishing fleets all over the world. Each fish has a different type of season, and the first guys who can land their catch, they're the ones that really can sell this for the biggest money. So this team has decided, look, it's kind of too early to do this because it's still pretty bad weather, but the fish are out there now. We know they're running. Let's go and get them. Hmm. Now, you tell me, is this a true story or not? Of course, I don't know, but the researchers really have glommed onto this and said that's probably the most likely story that's involved here. These guys are chasing the big, the big bucks by being the first people to land a catch back at the dock if they survive. <laughs> Hokusai also used a special dark blue color known as Prussian blue. Alfred, please tell me about that and why it was so novel and unique in Japan at the time. Uh, today, we call the blue in these prints Prussian blue. But in Hokusai's time, it was often just known as blue, as found on the advertisement for the series. It is a synthetic pigment that can be used to achieve a great variety of tones, but blue pigments made from indigo or dayflower blue the other main source of blue at the time. Unlike them, it is a robust pigment that does not fade. It reached Japan from China as an expensive novelty in the middle 1700s. But around 1827, China began manufacturing the pigment in bulk, lowering the cost to a point where it became cost-effective to use in commercial prints. The luminous quality of the pigment had tremendous visual appeal and also had an exotic quality, as it recalled the kind of blue found on imported Chinese blue and white porcelain. Rich blue waters and skies would have been a novelty in commercial printing at the time. Yeah. Traditionally, blue colors used in Japanese art were delicate and could fade rapidly under sunlight. So many painters started to use it because it was stronger against fading and you could make deep colors and beautiful gradations easily. So I'm sure it's a lifesaver for printers. And when it was introduced to Japan, am I correct in saying that Hokusai's publisher sort of jumped at the opportunity mm -hmm. and commissioned this in order mm -hmm. to use the color and take advantage of it? Yeah. Yes. As a publisher, he was very aware of, of, of popular trends mm -hmm. and would have been um, keen to take advantage of the interest in Prussian blue. To sell a lot. <laughs> to sell a lot. There we go. Yes. Yeah. Fiorella, what was it like trying to emulate that very particular color? Well, we have this very set Lego color palette, and that color palette is what makes Lego Lego, right? So we mm. don't deviate from it very much. Yeah. And as luck would have it, when we went to see the piece in the, the British Museum, it was almost an exact match. Wow. wow. I kid you not. <laughs> it was really, you know, we were high-fiving <laughs> in, in, in the area. I'm sure people around us are wondering, what on earth are they doing? Um, yes. But <laughs> it was really, really delightful to discover that. And mm. when we were there, we also looked at a depiction of the Great Wave made by the British Museum. Uh, it's a recreation of what the colors would look like if it was made fresh. Wow. And that was really interesting to see because all the versions that we've seen, you know, across the internet and, you know, and a lot of other exhibitions have been the really faded versions. And we can see the Prussian yep. blue. It's still such an incredible pigment that it still holds to this day, but the rest of the colors less so, right? Yeah. So when we saw the recreation, again, that was another moment of like, wow, we have to do this. And so the version, the Lego version that you see mm -hmm. is a recreation of the recreation. Ah, <laughs> um, okay. So it should be what we imagine the fresh version of Hokusai's Great Wave would look like with this beautiful peach in the background and the sky. And yeah, so it, it was a delight. So let's talk about the frame in the Lego art version of the Great Wave. Fiorella, why did you choose to have a frame and why this type of frame? Yeah, so I'll start with the colour. Actually, we chose a fairly light coloured frame, you know, with a decent amount of spacing because this we felt was faithful to the version we saw at the British Museum. And recreated in Lego, we felt it was also necessary to let the picture sing. Mm. 
and have a more subtle frame to give it as much air to the piece as possible. Yeah. So we also tried a version where the frame was black. So it had a black edge as well as with some versions. But, you know, every time we looked at it, it still felt more appropriate actually to have this lighter frame because it just really kind of brought the center stage to life. And I want to talk a bit about the frame itself and its build because when you build this, and for those who are listening right now, maybe you're building it right now, you'll realize that the frame isn't done at the end like with other Lego art pieces. In fact, the piece should end with you clicking your Lego masterpiece, the center stage, into place yeah, yeah. at the very end. So it offers a really, really satisfactory ending to your experience. And it's such a lovely detail that the team has come up with that we're really hoping that you would enjoy. That's all we have time for, but if you want to hear more, we have a bonus episode where we dive a little bit deeper into Hokusai as an artist. Hear about how he was influenced and inspired by Dutch landscape paintings. Hokusai is aware of Dutch shading and he is applying his understanding of it to views of Japan in a way that is very, very interesting. About how he influenced European artists. I'm actually sometimes surprised how, how big he is. I think the, the wave is part of it. I mean, I think also the fact that he did do manga, that he did do sketches of people, I think was also something that appealed to Europeans. How prints back in the day weren't framed like we normally see. Some people did keep these things, but it just wasn't anything that we would expect. You know, they were disposable objects. And about the signature in the upper left corner. The title of this work is written in the rectangle. 36 views of Mount Fuji, the great wave of Kanagawa. How is your piece of art coming along? Have you clicked your Lego masterpiece into place and getting ready to hang it on the wall? If not, you can do that while you listen to the bonus episode. Thank you to our guests, Japanese art curator Naoko Mikami, manga and anime expert Susan Napier, curator of Japanese art at the British Museum, Alfred Haft, woodblock printmaker David Bull, and Lego art creative lead Fiorella Groves. My name is Tatiana Saraino, and this has been an original soundtrack from Lego Art. Thanks for listening. See you in the bonus episode. Welcome to the bonus episode from LEGO Art about Hokusai and the Great Wave. My name is Tatiana Seraino, and again, I'm joined by curator of Japanese art at the British Museum, Alfred Haft, woodblock printmaker David Bull, Japanese art curator Naoko Mikami, LEGO Art creative lead Fiorella Groves, and manga and anime expert Susan Napier. As we talked about in the main episode, Japan was closed off from the outside world for more than 200 years at the time. But still, Hokusai was influenced and inspired by Dutch landscape paintings. Alfred Haft, can you tell us more about that? Well, the Dutch had a outpost in an island off of Nagasaki called Dejima, and they weren't allowed to leave that island except for special occasions to visit the shogun once a year. But during one of those visits, the directors of the Dutch training post um, in Nagasaki had some, in some way connected with Hokusai oh. and commissioned a series of paintings of views of Japanese life. Right. So Hokusai, even in the 1820s, was already someone who was outside of the sort of the standard world of painting, had connections with the Dutch, and is exploring in his own work these paintings that he produced are remarkable for their use of shading. So Hokusai is aware of Dutch shading and he is applying his understanding of it to views of Japan in a way that is very, very interesting. So the Dutch, in a sense, not just literally in his art, but also in the opportunities that were afforded him yes. to explore other kinds of subjects came through the Dutch. It's a very interesting connection there. It is. It's fascinating. And uh, it's it's funny to think if there wasn't that connection, um, how it would have turned out otherwise. Um, I think uh, yes, their, their influence is uh, not to be underestimated. Mm.
So Hokusai was influenced and inspired by the Dutch, but I'm sure his own work must have influenced other Japanese artists at the time. Nako Mikami, would you agree with me on that? Mm, yes, absolutely. Hokusai had a strong influence over the Japanese artists of his age. He pioneered many styles and techniques. And when those were successful, other artists did not hesitate to copy him in order to boost their own commercial success. Yes, well, um, Hokusai himself had many students who became important artists in their own right, including his youngest daughter, Oi, who worked beside him in his final years. Um, and in more recent years, um, his influence continues today, he has influenced the work of such wide-ranging Japanese artists as Yoko Tadunori, Nara Yoshitomo, and Nana Shiomi, who was a print designer in the UK. And what in particular from The Great Wave resonated with and influenced modern European artists? I'd like to hear from both of you, Naoko and Alfred, if you think we can see evidence of The Great Wave interwoven into their paintings. Well, there was an obvious influence over Western artists like Van Gogh. I think Monet actually collected Hoxai's works. Yes, Monet is known to have owned a copy of the print and to have based his treatment of water on the blue of Japanese prints. Right, yes. And famously also, Debussy's composition La Mer was um, inspired from the Great Wave. Right. Mm -hmm. And a version of it decorated the cover of the published musical score for his composition. Mm, yes. Paul Gauguin and the American artist Jean Lafarge produced work that seems to show awareness of the composition. Susan Napier, as an anime expert and professor of Japanese literature, culture, and animation, you've written a book called From Impressionism to Anime, where you also talk about Hokusai's influence on Monet and the Impressionists. There were certainly other Japanese woodblock print artists, but Hokusai was the biggest. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, I'm actually sometimes surprised how, how big he is. I think the, the wave is part of it, because there are other wonderful print artists. But Hokusai, he very, it's very clear if you look at the history. And I, in, in writing the book, I was actually looking at um, going back to um, our library and the university I was working in, had uh, original copies of um, journals from France or magazines from France about art and you can see this discovery of um, Japanese art sort of happening in front of your eyes as I'm reading these things from the 1860s, 1870s and very definitely Hokusai is just mentioned so much more than anybody else. Mm. I mean, I think also the fact that he did do manga, that he did do sketches of people, which is not as typical or really sort of human sketches, not just beautiful courtesans, I think was also something that appealed to Europeans who were also sort of going away from the kind of monumental art mm. and the sort of sense of, you know, w wanting to connect more with, with what's going on. And Hokusai was very good at that in both his manga and his other works. Wow, thank you. So that really gives us a sense of how impactful it was when it's arrived in the West, and we cannot right. underestimate the impact that it did have. Absolutely. Mm. Quite a white rage. And that doesn't even begin to cover the influence in the decorative arts, mm. where Hokusai was vastly influential, perhaps more than any, any other Japanese artist in, in what we call Impressionism, that period. And it's almost funny in a way, because from the West, we tend to see it as a quintessentially Japanese work of art. But is it rather fair to say that it's actually a hybrid of both Japanese and European ideas? Yes. Absolutely. Mm. Yes. Mm. Absolutely. It is Japanese in its subject, and yet we have this imported element in the in the Prussian blue, and also in the the very well understood and digested use of Western perspective, and the rhythm of the brush marks, mm. the the fineness of the brush marks derives in some way from Chinese what what is called a scholar's painting, what is also called um, literati painting in Japanese is called bunjinga, in Chinese is called wenren hua. And the use of brush marks, not to define shapes, but as an expressive feature, is also something in, that we see in this print and in, and in the series as a whole. It, it is, mm. Hokusai absorbed everything and transformed it into his own mode of, of communication, really. It's fantastic. It really does seem so. And it feels like the Great Wave is almost like this culmination of all his skill and his experience and him overcoming obstacles in his life. Yes. And and what is also interesting about it is that the way it the, its position in the series as a whole, there there are a couple of other prints that are in a, in a sense more abstract and graphic, mm. and there are other prints that are more 
narrative and more like genre subjects. But somehow this print seems to balance those two elements. It is both powerfully graphic and powerfully narrative. And I think that may be one of the reasons why it has been um, so compelling in the West. And because the circumstance of it, it requires no explanation. It did mean something particular, of course, at the time, but it has since now become what has been called a global icon. Absolutely. Meaning that it is accessible uh, to people around the world, whatever the original source was, people may never have heard of Hokusai. People may never have had any interest in Japan. And yet there is something, as I said at the beginning, elemental about the um, composition and the circumstance of the print that is immediately recognizable wherever you are, even if you don't live near the water. Basically, <laughs> absolutely, it's that's very true, and I think it's also as you're saying this sense of um, of drama and uh, inevitability and perhaps even monumentality and that comes through the print, which is both very particular to what was happening uh, in Japan at the time, but it's also quite timeless, and perhaps that has also contributed to the fact that the Great Wave has become such an icon. Mm, yes, all mm. over the world. Mm, absolutely. And Susan, can you tell me how much Monet was influenced by the Thirty Six Views of Mount Fuji? Well, I think I do suggest in my book, and I'm sure that I'm not the only person who has suggested, there are a lot of books on um, uh, the Impressionists and Japanese woodblock prints. I mean, it's very clear that you would not have had Impressionism. You probably wouldn't have had the Jugendstil, uh, Art Nouveau. You wouldn't have had people like Klimt. Um, all of this is very directly uh, related to Japanese prints, to the color, the uh, topics, uh, the kind of the experiment all that was very much part of it. But the particular example I use is Monet's, not just his haystacks, and he did, how, did he do, I can't remember how many haystacks he did, but a, a whole lot of them, and they are beautiful. About 30. They're haystacks at mm. different, that, exactly, I didn't want to say 36, but yeah, 30. <laughs> but they're, you know, haystacks in the morning, haystacks in the autumn, haystacks, you know, freshly um, put together. And clearly this, this joy in taking one subject and looking at it again in a different way, in a different, literally different light, different perspective, different kind of landscape is exactly what Hokusai was doing. And it does seem like that would not have occurred necessarily as far, I can't think of any other pre-impressionist Western artists who do that. I could be wrong. You're the art historian. <laughs> uh, the other, of course, is um, Rouen, the cathedral, yes, that's that true. I think is, is related to Hokusai. And again, the whole idea of doing many images of a single subject and many iterations, but all the same subject, but all different. And it really is wonderful how we can sort of um, see influences of Hokusai's Great Wave and his other works come through in actual physical, tangible works of art. Uh, one that calls to mind is Van Gogh's Starry Night. I think I see a similar sense of fluidity and movement and cool. dynamism in the <laughs> in the sky. I had never thought of that. That's really interesting, Tatiana. I, <laughs> uh, I like that. It totally makes sense to me because what is all that whirling going on up there? <laughs> you know, come, come. I mean, I just don't see it in your average, you know, mm. night sky scene from any earlier period. I think you're really onto something there. That's fascinating. Dang. <laughs> you know, that's so spot on. You've got it. Yeah. Oh, great. That's fantastic to hear. So overall, you agree that Hokusai had a, a big influence on Western art? Absolutely. Mm. Really, really big. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're, we're so lucky <laughs> that that they that, that the streams um, met in that period to create the extraordinary art that we see. And Hokusai, just to clarify, he never left Japan. Um, so we could say that, you know, he never got to see the world, but the world certainly got to see his work, right? Absolutely. Oh, yes, mm. absolutely. We are very lucky, mm. lucky for us <laughs> that, it, that it did. Yes, because so much is lost and that this print survives and his work survives is, is, is I think, not only a testament to um, uh, the interest of, of Hokusai in the, in the West, but also we have to think, how do these prints survive? Because yes. Japanese collected them and preserved them. They went overseas, but they were recognized for a period and an important period in Japan. And that is why we are lucky enough to have them today. Absolutely. As Susan mentioned earlier, he really sounds like a playful character. 
And Alfred, I've heard that he could also become very creative when making pictures. Is that right? Um, yes, uh, because Hokusai could paint with anything. Um, a, a brush, a bottle, an egg, <laughs> and even a live, yes, and even a live chicken. Um, and in a performance before the Shogun, he uh, requested a long sheet of paper and blue ink and red ink. And along the long sheet of paper, he painted a blue streak. And then he requested a chicken, a live chicken. He took the chicken by the neck. He dipped the feet in the red ink and then dipped it like a stamp along the blue. And people said, what in the world is that? <laughs> and his answer was um, a very traditional theme of autumn maple leaves in the Tatsuta River. Oh, God. Oh, okay. And that um, took the prize in, in a sort of painting contest against a court painter at the time who was very annoyed. <laughs> That's fantastic. He sounds yes. like such an eccentric individual as well. Yes, he was fantastic. I mean, he is spur of the moment and he really had a fantastic improvisational quality and um, a, a really lively, lively person. I love all these legends that come through about him. Yes. It's, it's great to remember them alongside his art as well. Yes. <laughs> I think I remember reading that he refused to clean his studio. He would simply move when it got too dirty and he moved up uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> about 90 times. Well, something like that, yes. Susan, do you think that some of his personality shines through his manga or is it purely just a commissioned piece of oh, work? Oh, God, absolutely. You know, he was so, he had such facility. I mean, it, it may be commissioned, but it's not like, oh my God, I'm going to have to build a Sistine Chapel. <laughs> uh, these are things that were done, you know, not quite tossed off, but especially with the manga, they, you know, they, and certainly uh, woodblock printing is a fairly complicated process and you have a lot of different steps in it. But the original pictures, I mean, especially of manga, uh, there's a real organic quality to his pictures that I, I think is because he's so good at it. Uh, and so his own, you know, I think just the way he looked at the world, I mean, to go from 1760 Japan to 1849 Japan, that that's traversing a huge chunk of history. And he obviously you know, saw himself as, you know, a bit of an eccentric, but there is a long tradition in Japan of artistic eccentrics. And I think he enjoyed that. So yeah, I feel like he's, he's someone who was just, um, I don't want to idealize him because I don't know him. <laughs> you know, I've never met, unfortunately, maybe you never know. Uh, if one could have a dinner party of people you'd like to invite, because <laughs> I would definitely be a person I would invite to a dinner party. Um, I thought bet he'd be a lot of fun. But I think he did revel in, in the world, and that comes through in his woodblock print. Mm. He had such a fantastic attitude to life in general, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he would have been in his 50s when he made the uh, Hokusai manga. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. At the age of 50, he went through uh, incredible struggles, and this is after that. It's just incredible to think that he's still kind of developing so much. Yes, I love that. And yeah, I mean, he was doing, you know, pretty well, you know, doing the standard good work and starting to use some um, new things that were coming in from the West, new techniques, new perspective. But, you know, by the age of 50, a lot of people have are played out. <laughs> and um, it is wonderful that he then, you know, kind of has this almost a renaissance, a sort of psychological renaissance. And by the way, he starts in 1814 at the age of 54. But then, of course, he continues mm. up until his death. I think being able to, to do sort of what you like to do, your just fun sketches, probably is very liberating. Mm. And it may have been actually something that helped get his creative juices flowing. You know, he's still, um, you know, really doing various things. But I think perhaps this outlet for creativity that the manga provided may have been very good. Yeah. It's incredible. And in total, I think he created about 30,000 works of art. And it's yes. important to kind of recognize that a lot of that artwork came even before the Great Wave. Yes. Um, as you mentioned, he was vastly productive, producing thousands of prints and paintings and more than 260 illustrated books. And when I say illustrated books, that means um, illustrated book titles, because each title has multiple volumes. And each volume would have had perhaps a dozen or more illustrations. So you begin counting on, you know, a calculator to do that uh, a bit of math to, to just his productivity was astonishing. Yes, he was, definitely. Yes. And the Great Wave itself was printed at least 8,000 times, is that correct? Yes, and since then. And the, the fact that the wave occurs in the work of other artists of Hokusai's time mm -hmm is very powerful evidence of, of the sort of the visual impact that this print had. Indeed. So, for example, the work of, of Hokusai's contemporary Hiroshige and later prints and, and other artists, there are sort of quotes and echoes of 
not just a wave, but Hokusai's wave. Wow, that's incredible. Yes. So when Hokusai was 50 years old, something dramatic happened to him. Tell me about that. Well, um, one afternoon, while returning from a temple, Hokusai is said to have been struck by lightning. Hokusai scholar Roger Keyes has associated that event with a turning point in Hokusai's style, suggesting that afterward he had difficulty drawing long, continuous lines and instead turned to sequences of fine marks, which is the kind of style we see in the 36 views of Mount Fuji. That's very interesting to to hear that it kind of uh, pushed him in a different direction, perhaps, almost then. Yes, Mm. stylistically, yes. Um, Hokusai was somebody who was constantly advancing and adapting to his own circumstances and to the circumstances around him. I mean, that's a very forward a person who is propelled forward Mm. and is able to move forward and around all kinds of um, obstacles. Do you think that we could perhaps read elements of Hokusai's personal life struggles in this print, or is that going a bit too far? No, I think that that is is possibly also a very important element of of his uh, of what was perhaps behind his thinking in the design, because the series, the thirty six views of Mount Fuji, in a sense, was a, a life saving commission. Because in the late 1820s, Hokusai suffered a stroke. He suffered the loss of his second wife. Um, He also was dealing with a a really um, uncontrollable grandson who was racking up gambling debts that Hokusai had to cover. And he was really felt completely insecure in his position as an artist and in the world. And this commission came along. And it really reestablished his career in a fantastic way. And there must be something about the sort of the navigating of seemingly overpowering um, obstacles Mm -hmm. and threats, and yet managing to push through, which we hope the boats will do, that one can only suppose it had, had some personal connection for Hokusai. Absolutely. I I really like what you said, this idea of Mount Fuji kind of standing tall and uh, combating the the natural elements together with the fishing boats themselves. I think in in a way perhaps Mm. could be likened to Hokusai himself pushing through all these Mm. obstacles that he had to overcome. Yes. Remaining an anchor through all of the chaos. Exactly. Remaining an anchor through all the chaos. Fantastic. Hokusai's last words were recorded as follows. Uh, Well, Naoko, perhaps I should uh, direct it over to you. Would you like to read the words for us? Absolutely. Since I was six years old, I have loved to copy the shapes of things. And although I have painted many works at around the age of 50, by the time I reached 70, all the paintings I had made felt insignificant. At the age of 73, I was able to draw some figures and shapes of various creatures and plants. Then when I reach 86, I'm sure my skill will improve more and more. And at 90, all mysteries will be mastered. From the age of 100, it will be able to reach the realm of divine. Beyond that stage, A single point drawn on the paper will become a living thing as if it had a quiet life. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's great to hear his words come through. What a spirit. (laughs) I think that really sums up his approach. And I think he was always aiming for something higher. It seems like he was never quite satisfied with himself. Yes. Well, um, it is an inspiring ambition Mm. that Hokusai lived up to, not literally to 110, but the idea of keeping advancing and developing throughout his entire career, and even into the great paintings that um, dominate his final years in the 1840s. He was always aiming to better himself, which is a fantastic attitude. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, totally. I think we can all learn from Hokusai. (laughs) Absolutely. I'd like to bring you, David Bull, back into the conversation. As we talked about in the main episode, you and your woodblock printing team did about 2,000 prints of the Great Wave. And I've heard that you kind of asked Hokusai for, quote unquote, permission to do this. I went back to the guy we're talking about today, Hokusai, and I said, can I, uh, you know, can I like use your design? And he didn't say no. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, of course, I mean, I'm joking about that, but there's no copyright involved here. You know, the concept of copyright is mm. quite modern, and he worked, this print was designed in, what was it, the 18, uh, 1820s, 1830s? 1830s, I'm not sure. yes. There was no mm. question of copyright. So, so I am, of course, completely free to use this in any way that I wish. So when I say we asked him for permission, we did, myself and some of our printers, we actually did, partway along in the process, we visited his grave which is in a temple just about five minutes' walk from my workshop. And we, I say we, I didn't chat much. I just stood there while the girls, you know, talked to him and we left some food and we sort of said, hey, look, you know, we'd like your cooperation and stood there quietly for a few minutes. No, really, it's sort of a semi-serious thing. The girls here, the, my, my co-workers here, yeah. were really quite serious about this. They're more, uh, a little bit more serious Buddhists than I am, of course. I'm not at all. So we got hook size permission to do this. I carved the blocks and our printing team, group by group by group, has been printing them ever since. We made our edition in 2017 and it's been in publication, in print ever since then. And the blocks are still actually hanging in pretty well. We often see the Great Wave in a frame, even in the Lego art set. But framing wasn't something they did back in Hokusai's time in Edo, Japan, right? No, of course not. The, the thing that we call a frame mm. didn't even exist in this country before Westerners brought such a thing. I, know I mentioned earlier that these ukiyo-e prints were not art. And of course, a typical Japanese house, nobody had the idea that you would actually, like, there were no frames. Now, in a typical Japanese house or, or shack of the day, there was no hanging on the wall whatsoever. There were art objects, scrolls. They would always go in the alcove of a Japanese room, in the tokonoma. And this would only be upper-class people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Not your common and garden city people who didn't have access to such expensive art. So the upper-class people would have nothing to do with the prints, the lower class people would have nothing to do with the scrolls. The lower class townspeople, whatever, walking out one day, they see this bookshop. Oh, that's a cool picture. It was cheap. They bought it, brought it home. They're going to do one of two things with it. They're going to look it around, look it around, put it in the table, look around, put it in the table. Or they might just get some rice from dinner tonight, which actually is paste. You put it in your bowl, spit in it, mix it up, mix it up with your fingers. It makes paste. Rub it on the back corners of this print and stick it up on one of your screens. You know, the fusuma door, which is a divider between rooms here in Japan, is actually a paper screen. Now, this normal working class family doesn't have Biobu screens themselves, but they've got these Fusuma doors. So rub some rice on the back of this print, stick it up on this screen, and there it is. It's there for as long as it lasts until you change the paper on the screen or the kids scratch it or whatever. It just gets, you know, thrown out with the daily use. Alfred, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, that's an interesting question because there was one kind of work of art that Hokusai was sometimes involved with, which was plaques dedicated to shrines. And they were framed. They were mounted and they were displayed outdoors, although they were not often oil paints. They were um, more of the kinds of paints that are vulnerable to the elements, but yeah, in any way, they were displayed outdoors. But aside from those, which is a special case, works were not framed. Prints, of course, were not framed. Mm -hmm. They probably were kept in, in albums. Yep, yep. The reason why we have them left over, because some people did like, oh, let's keep this. And they got this little scrapbook and glued mm. them into their scrapbook and stuff like that. So those things come up sometimes at auctions. Absolutely. A scrapbook left over from the late Edo period with a bunch of woodblock prints pasted into it, that kind of thing. I have some cheaper examples in my own collection and not anything involving a great wave, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but, so yes, so they were. Some people did keep these things, but it just wasn't anything that we would expect. You know, They were disposable objects. Yes, these prints were meant to be affordable and to be spread in big numbers to the masses, right? Yep, and they were completely disposable. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yep, yep. But the main form of displaying picture was, of course, the hanging scroll. Mm -hmm. And hanging scrolls could be unrolled and then rolled up. And that's how they were easy to store that way and changed for um, welcoming special guests or the change of the seasons and so on, depending upon how many you had in your storehouse, you could have all kinds of uh, paintings for different occasions. Cirella, why did you choose to have a frame and why this type of frame? 
actually. We chose a fairly light coloured frame, you know, with a decent amount of spacing because this, we felt, was faithful to the version we saw at the British Museum. And recreated in Lego, we felt it was also necessary to let the picture sing mm. and have a more subtle frame to give it as much air to the piece as possible. Yeah. And I want to talk a bit about the frame itself and its build because when you build this, you'll realize that the frame isn't done at the end like with other Lego art pieces. In fact, the piece should end with you clicking your Lego masterpiece, the center stage, into place mm -hmm. at the very end. And it's such a lovely detail that the team has come up with that we're really hoping that you would enjoy. Hokusai's signature is in the top left corner of the print and not in the lower right corner as we typically see in Western paintings. Alfred, why is that? And was that common in Japanese paintings? That is not common on Japanese paintings, where signatures often appear along the lower side of the margins. But one does encounter it often on Japanese prints, like The Great Wave, where the placement of the artist's signature, the publisher's seal, and the censor's seal often flexibly accommodated to the arrangement of the design. Right. In fact... Other artists just signed here and there, <laughs> all over the place. Even in calligraphy, which is very codified art form, signature can go to different places. And in this case, what does the signature actually say? The title of this work is written in the rectangle. 36 views of Mount Fuji, the great wave of Kanagawa. On the left is Hokusai's signature, but it's a bit funny. The signature says, drawn by Hokusai, who changed his name to Iizu. <laughs> it's famous that he changed uh, his name a lot. Now, I find this fascinating, but Hokusai changed his name at least 30 times in his life. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Why did he do that? And was it common for Japanese artists at the time? Well, that's a very interesting cultural question. Everyone in Hokusai's day changed names at different stages of their lives. The changes were often related to age and occupation. Artists also sometimes changed name, but Hokusai was unusual in the variety of names he used and the frequency with which he changed them. For him, the names reflected personal beliefs as well as life events. Hokusai literally means North Studio and refers to Hokusai's belief in the North Star as the seat of a powerful, benevolent Buddhist deity called Myoken. The name Iitsu is understood to mean one again, and Hokusai adopted it at the age of 61 when he was entering a new 60-year cycle in the East Asian calendar. It reflects Hokusai's powerful wish for health and longevity. Now, Ko, I know that you have heard that there's another reason for the name changing. Mm, yes. Legend has it that he changed his name so he could sell the previous one to his disciples. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it would then be easier for them to capitalize on their master's fame and make a living faster. <laughs> but that's just a story and I don't know if it's true or not. It's a bit like selling a startup or brand. You grow the company for a couple of years and resell it for a huge amount of money. Then you just repeat the process until you can buy a nice house in Miami. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. That is really interesting. And I think I remember at some point reading that the final name that he ever uh, adopted meant something along the lines of the man who was mad about painting. Is that true? Yes, yes. Gakkyo Rojin. Yes, the old man who was mad about painting. And that um, shows his lifelong obsession with painting. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that Hokusai intended for this particular view, the Great Wave, to have a stronger impact than the rest in the series? Do you think that he felt it was special? That's a really interesting question. I mean, he must have felt, something must have clicked when he put it together. I, I, I don't know how else to, <laughs> yeah. to explain it. But that the theme of waves and water was had already been compelling to him for decades. Mm -hmm. So he was already a subject that he had been thinking about in general. Sure. These large waves also were a 
something that he had explored in earlier prints. And there must have been something in this design that for him pulled together in a, in a, in a very powerful way. Yes, I think so too. At least I like to believe that. And because he returns to a version of it in the 100 views of Mount Fuji, oh. there is an illustration which is similar with a huge cresting wave which appears, the, the claws of the wave appear to transform into seabirds. There's a flock of seabirds behind the wave, but it's such a subtle effect and, and so clever and inventive. But the fact that he returned to the wave in that next series of Mount Fuji views is not a coincidence. Wow, yes, that's, that's fascinating. How about you, Naoko? Do you also think Hokusai knew that this was something special? I think so, because he's Hokusai. <laughs> <laughs> He foresees everything. <laughs> and with those words, we've come to the end of the bonus episode about Hokusai and the Great Wave. I hope you found it just as interesting listening to as I have, talking to our guests, woodblock printmaker David Bull, curator of Japanese art at the British Museum, Alfred Haft, Japanese art curator Naoko Mikami, Lego art creative lead Fiorella Groves, and manga and anime expert Susan Napier. My name is Tatiana Seraino, and this has been an original soundtrack from LEGO Art. Thanks for listening. <laughs>